right, good morning, everyone. If you don't mind, we're going to pray one more time before we open up the Word of God. So let's do that. Father in heaven, we want to thank you this morning for your Word. We want to thank you for being our God and loving us the way you do. And we ask that just as we have worshipped you this morning, we pray that your Spirit would continue to be here with us, continue to Uh, be upon us. Lord, give us wisdom, give us understanding, help us to apply the truths we learn in your word this morning to our lives, that we would bring glory and honor to you. And we pray this in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. Well, good morning, everyone. Glad you are all here. And I just want to welcome you to 412 Church in Marietta. And I want to say hello to those of you that are watching online as well. Glad you're with us. If you are a disciple of Jesus, meaning two things, he is your Lord, and He is your Savior. I want to remind you to win your friends, win your family, and win your neighbors for Jesus. Amen? Amen. Amen. Uh, If you are just joining us, you're just checking out this whole Christian thing, we are glad you are with us. We want you to know that God accepts you just as you are, and He sees the potential of who you can be. In other words, He's going to accept you as you are, but He will never leave you the way He found you. God always does some amazing things in our lives, and we just give Him the opportunity. So glad you are with us. Hope you enjoy your time. You may have heard of this thing in my hand. It's called a Bible. A lot of people don't like it nowadays, especially when you put it on advertisements at the malls. Um, Those of you who saw Greg Laurie's Bible get taken out, you know what I'm talking about. But but here's the deal. Um, This is the inerrant and the infallible word of the living God, meaning everything in here is perfect. You can base your life on it. You can put your trust in it. It will never fail you. And so we are going to be in the Bible today. There's a concept for church, huh? We're going to be in the Bible, Genesis chapter 26, if you want to make your way there. Genesis chapter 26, and the title of today's message is 500, Digging Your Well. <clears throat> Excuse me. Um, before we get into the message, let me just remind those of you who are citizens of the city of Menifee, this coming Tuesday, 4.30, at the school district office, is the school board meeting. I talked about that last week. They, um, they've got that perverted sexual ed curriculum that's being forced on the children, and um, we don't want that to be forced on the children. So we're going to stand in front of the school board. You don't have to say anything. Uh, we've selected a few pastors, uh, of the pastors. Uh, there's only three pastors, actually, out of a group of eight uh, that have come together. Only three of us are going to be speaking at this. So we don't need you to, to stand up and say anything. All we would like is for you to show up. So tell your, tell your friends, your family, your neighbors, people you know that don't want this perversion to be taught and forced to be taught on your children, tell them to be there at 4.30. Take off work, do whatever you have to do to get there. I mean, we take off of work for doctor's appointments and stuff like that because those things are important to us. How important is preserving our community for our children? How important is it to ensure their safety? This is, this is a safety issue for our children. So 4.30 this Tuesday, and um, just show up at the school district office. If you don't know where that is, it's, it's, if you, you know where Yellow Basket is in Menifee, there's that circle right there. It's the building right in the center of the circle. So uh, this Tuesday. All right, let's get into the message. Um, we are in this series called Potential, but we're going to take a break today from the the potential series. And so it's a one-day break, a one-week break from this. And um, if you missed any of the potential series so far, you can go to 412marietta.com forward slash sermons and you can catch up with us. But today I want to talk to you about something that Paul said in the book of Ephesians. He said this, he says that Jesus loved the church and gave himself for her. Now the church is Anybody who is a disciple, how many disciples of Jesus do we have in here? Okay, you're the church. God loves you. And it says that he he loves the church. He gave himself for you, that he might sanctify and cleanse you with the washing of water by the word. So when we're we're looking at what God's talking about here, the the preached word, the the word of God that, that I say every week is the infallible word, the Bible This is the Word of God. And what he does is he takes his Word, and as you take the Word in, 
there's an actual cleansing that's going on. It says that he might present her, he might present you to himself, a glorious church, not having spot or wrinkle or any such thing, but that she should be holy. You should be holy without blemish. And so what Paul is telling us here in the book of Ephesians is that something happens when we take in God's word, when it comes in through our ears, when it comes in through our eyes, it goes into our hearts. God's word effectively works in you as you believe in God, and it does something to your soul. God's word does a cleansing in the life of a believer. And I love in Psalm 119, verse 11, you've heard this verse before, I'm sure. It says, your word I've hidden in my heart that I might not sin against you. Think Think along these terms. A, a person gets into a car and they're driving along and they run through a red light. And a police officer pulls them over and says, you're getting a ticket for running the red light. You can't say, well, I didn't know. You not knowing doesn't help, right? You're responsible to know the, the law before you get behind an automobile. That's why we take a test, we get passed, and we get a license to drive. We, we know the laws, and not knowing the laws is, is no, you know, it doesn't permit it. You know, you can't, it's no excuse to say, well, I didn't know. Same thing here. What we do is we say, Lord, I'm going to hide your word in my heart. I'm going to study. The Bible says to study and show yourself approved. I'm going to study the word of God. I'm going to put it into my heart so that way I know what pleases God. I know what displeases God. And I want to live my life as a believer in a way that I please God and not displease God. I mean, the same thing when the Bible says to study and show yourself approved. The idea there is the same way a husband would study his wife. You know what's going to make her happy. You know what's going to put a smile on her face, right, Jake? Newlyweds. <laughs> got to know. You got to study your wife. Got to study Nikki. You know what's going to put a smile on her face. Same thing. We got to study the Word of God. We got to hide it in our heart that we won't sin against Him. Now that we know, we know not to do it. Now that we know the things we're supposed to do, we can do them. Make sense? Yeah. All right. So the Word of God does something in us. And I'm calling this message 500 Digging Your Well. And I want to explain the title for a moment. Today is my 500th sermon. I've been collecting every sermon I've ever written, and when I say written, this is my 500th sermon I've written. Of course, this is the second time I've delivered this sermon today, so I don't count this as two. I, you know, I wrote one sermon. Um, I've delivered way more than that because over the course of time, you know, you deliver it multiple times sometimes, so 500 sermons, and it was told to me when I first started preaching that delivering a sermon, writing a sermon to deliver is like digging a well. And every time, I was told, every time you preach, every time you dig in, you're digging this well for yourself. And, and every time you're doing it, you're digging it deeper, you're digging it wider, and the deeper it is, the more you have to draw from. The deeper it is, the purer it is. The deeper it is, the cooler it is. There, there's something about digging a well really deep. It costs you a lot, but the benefits of it are, you know, far outweigh the cost. Same thing goes for you guys. And that's what I want to talk to you about today. Every time you open up the Word of God, every time you start to dig in, you just open up and say, all right, Lord, what do you have to say to me today? You open it up and you start to dig into God's Word. You're digging your personal well. And every time you open it up, if you open it up often enough, you'll find out what I'm talking about when I say that. But if you open this up often enough, every time you open this up, you're digging your well. It gets deeper. It gets wider. You have more to draw from. Your understanding is purer. What you have to use is pure. You, you just have more of God's word the deeper it gets and the wider it gets. It's just an amazing thing to see God work in your life as you start to trust his word and dig into his word more and more. And so if you're a note taker, I want to give you three takeaways this morning, three things that you need to know about digging your personal well. And also there's going to be four wells that we talk about. And I want to define these wells. I want you to know these wells that, that a man named Isaac sets about to dig. So you all ready? Yeah. All right. Come on. Four of you today. Come on. Are you guys ready? It's the word of God we're talking about. This is exciting stuff. It's not boring. 
All right, let's do it. We're going to be in Genesis chapter 26, if you haven't made your way there. Genesis 26. And um, let me give you a little bit of context in Genesis 26 as you're, as you're making your way there. We're going to pick up in verse 15, but verses 1 through 14, you got the patriarchs of the Judeo-Christian faith. You got Abraham, you got Isaac, you got Jacob. Abraham, we know he is the father of many nations, right? We, we've got um, Abraham was this man that God made a promise with. He said, look, walk into this land. I'm going to show you. You got to go there. I'm going to show it to you. Everywhere you walk, it's going to be yours. I'm making this promise to you. And not only that, but your descendants are going to be more than the sand of the seashore, more than the stars of the sky. And that kind of made him chuckle and his wife chuckle because he was already old and his wife was old and they had passed the time of having kids. But God made a promise and we know that eventually in his lineage came a man named David, King David. God made a promise to him that through his lineage we would have the Messiah. And so that promise and God keeping that promise ultimately blesses all of us who call on Jesus. So you've got this man named Abraham who lives a life that's not perfect, but he lives a life that's full of faith. And we know if you read in Hebrews, there's a whole hall of faith in Hebrews. Abraham's listed there. He had a tremendous amount of faith, even to the point where he brought Isaac to the altar and was going to sacrifice his son Isaac. So he was a man of faith, but he wasn't perfect. I mean, there was a, a famine that came his way, and it's he, was, he knew where God had called him to be, but he tried to flee from, there, from that place. He thought, oh, you know what? This place God called me to is not going to be good. God can't meet my needs here. I'm going to go somewhere else. Well, God had to give him a little spiritual spanking and bring him back where he's supposed to go. And then he kind of had this you know, little blunder with his wife where he was afraid that they were going to steal his wife or kill him to get his wife. So he said, hey, honey, uh, I know you're my wife, but why don't you tell them you're my sister? Uh, that way they don't try to kill me to take you from me. And he didn't have faith. And, and so we see that, that he wasn't a perfect man, but he was a man that did have faith, and God blessed him. And God's blessings upon him transferred over, we see, to Isaac. Now, Isaac, on the stage here in Genesis 26, he's a man who kind of followed in his father's footsteps in more than one way. He was a man that did have faith, but he was also a man who had blunders, um, there was a famine that came upon the land when Isaac was there, and Isaac tried to do the same thing his dad did, tried to flee, and he wanted to go to Egypt, and God said, don't go to Egypt, shouldn't be going out to Egypt, I didn't call you to go to Egypt, why don't you stay in the land I told you to be in, I know you think better, you know better than me, but actually I'm God, and I know a little bit more than you do, Isaac. Um, so Isaac stays, and then he does the same thing his dad did. All right, honey, tell them you're my sister. And he's afraid they're going to kill him. So he does the same kind of garbage his dad did. And yet, through those things, God still blesses Isaac. In fact, it says that Isaac sowed in that land and he reaped a hundredfold. I mean, he just started doing so well. Uh, but people will hear stories like this and go, okay, mom and dad, you know, they messed up. Just like Abraham messed up and then, you know. Look at what happened. Isaac ended up doing the same thing his dad did, and it's going to be the same thing for me. So mom and dad, they kind of messed up with this stuff, but that's why I do what I do. It's just because mom and dad did it, so you know, I'm going to be like a millennial, and you millennials know what I'm talking about. You always blame the parents for everything, right? No? Okay. My millennial son does, but just joking, son. <laughs> but, but here's the deal. We, we, I think we all do this. We think, oh, well, you know, mom and dad did that, and so that's why I do it. And then some people even buy into a lie about the fourth commandment that, oh, you know, there's a curse on me because mom and dad did this, and so there's no way out of it. And then they misinterpret the fourth commandment. So we're not here to talk about that today, but that's just kind of the context of, of where we're at. Um, certainly, you know, sin of our parents' lives can affect us, but the faithfulness of our parents' lives affect us as well. And that's what I want to talk to you about today because the faithfulness of Abraham now has an effect on Isaac. And it's a good thing we're going to find this, this faithfulness transferring from person to person. In fact, Genesis 15 talks about this faithfulness of Abraham. It says that Abraham believed the Lord. When the Lord talked to Abraham, Abraham said to the word of God, yes, God is right. He says that the Lord counted him as righteous because of his faith. He has faith in what God says. And today, God speaks to us primarily through this thing we call the Bible. 
And when we hear what God says and we say yes to it, we're having faith just like Abraham and Isaac had. Now, certainly the influence that Abraham had over Isaac, we're going to see it, it has a, an amazing effect on Isaac. It gives him a tremendous amount of courage to, to push forward and to accomplish much in life. And as this is my 500th sermon, I want to tell you that I've been blessed to be raised up in a household. And when I was a kid, I was raised in a home where I had a godly dad and a godly mother who prioritized the Word of God and trained me up. And I, I just want to say they're here right now. That's my mom and dad right there. She hates it when I put the attention on her, but would you guys just wave so they can see who you are? That's my mom and dad right there. And um, I just got to say, it's a tremendous blessing to have parents, and I know not everybody has this, um, but I've been blessed to have this in my life where my mom and dad know the Word of God, and their influence in my life has been huge because I've seen a godly example of what it means to love one another. I've seen a godly example of what it means to train up children in the way they should go. I tell you guys all the time, I'm oldest of eight kids. It is no easy task to raise up eight kids. And if you look at my mother, you would never guess that she had eight kids. My dad's hair is falling out, so you would guess that he's had those kids. But, and I keep telling him, bald is beautiful, just take that stuff off. But, right? There you go. There you go. So, you know, the thing is, though, I've seen them be this blessing in my life and influence me to be a husband that loves your spouse, to love your wife and to bring peace in the home, and to honor God's commands. And I can tell you this, that the greatest of all the influences that they've had on me is the influence of digging into God's Word, and knowing God's Word, and trusting God's Word, and allowing God's Word not only to be lived out in their life, but allowing it to affect them in a way where in the face of hardships, they would trust him. Where the world would look at the situation and go, why are you doing that? It doesn't make sense. And they, they would answer, yes, I know it doesn't make sense, but God said it, and we believe it, and we're going to do it. And they've dug their well. And I'm telling you, it's not been an easy task for them digging their well. Um, they've had me as a son and I was a pill to them. I mean, I was so rebellious to them. And they had to dig in deep to that well and know what God had to say about raising up a rebellious kid. Because raising up a re I have no clue what it's like raising up a rebellious kid. I don't. My kids have never been rebellious. I don't know why I was, but I was. And my poor mom and dad had to suffer through that time and dig into God's word and apply it to the situation. And... They did a good job because here I am preaching my 500th sermon. So good job, mom and dad. <clears throat> but I want to talk to you all about digging your own personal well. And we need to understand water, especially in the time back then, but water, and even today in many parts of the world, water is a precious commodity. Water, we've, we grow our crops with water, we feed our herds with water, we, we water ourselves, you know, most of our body is comprised of water. You know, we need water. Water is a source of life and a source of cleansing. And, you know, when, when people were in Egypt, they had the Nile, you know, the Nile fed, fed all that area, but they weren't honoring God there in, in, in Egypt, right? They, there was so much false idols being worshipped there in Egypt. But what we do know is Egypt wasn't where God had called his people to be. He called them to be in Judea. He called them to be in Israel, the land of Canaan, the land of promise. But one thing you'll find in, in this land of promise is there's not a lot of rivers. There's no river there like the Nile. Uh, there are rivers there, but nothing like the Nile. Most of the places you go there, you have to dig. You have to dig deep and find the water so that way you have a well. And, and we read all throughout the scriptures of these areas where people would go and they would have to dig a well. And digging a well is not easy. Digging a well costs a lot. Digging a well takes time. 
uh, digging a well that's going to provide for you everything that you need is really, really difficult. But you have to dig. And digging your personal well is a personal venture. And when I say a personal venture, a venture is when you dare to do something or go somewhere that's dangerous or unpleasant. And I'm telling you, digging your personal well, digging into God's Word, it's unpleasant sometimes. It's difficult. It's dangerous. Why? Because there's an enemy that doesn't want you to dig it. There's an enemy after you trying to fill it in, trying to fill it in with garbage. And it's not, it's not easy. And so a lot of people don't even set out on that venture. There's a lot of people that do set out on it and they grow weary. And we're going to see that. But I want to give you those things. I told you I'd give you three things about this venture of digging your personal well. And the first thing is this. You and I, if, if you were blessed to have a parent like mine, you can't live solely off the previous generation's well. You can't. Um, Take a look at verse 15. There we find that the Philistines had stopped up all the wells which the, his father's servants had dug in the days of Abraham, his father. And they had filled them with earth. And verse 16, Abimelech said to Isaac, Go away from us, for you are much mightier than we. Then Isaac departed from there and pitched his tent in the valley of Gerar and dwelt there. So we know that from this that Isaac went back and saw his father's wells, but they had been filled in. You know, oftentimes, people die. <laughs> you know, that, that just kind of happens in life. Death is a part of life. If you are planning on just living the rest of your life on the well that your parents dug, your well, you're going to find it might not be there. Mom and dad move on sometimes. They go to heaven. And you can't just go, well, mom went to church, so I'm good. You know, dad read the Bible. He was really good at reading the Bible, so I'm good. You know, mom and dad, they gave a ton of money to the church. I'm good. You know, mom and dad, they were always serving at the church. I'm good. You know, you can't do that. See, they dug their well. You've got to dig your well. You've got to dig in deep. You can't just go, oh, yeah, mom and dad, mom and dad, mom and dad. No, it doesn't work that way. You can't stand before God and say, you know what, God, I, you know, mom and dad really did well. God's, God's looking at your life and going, what did you do with the access to my word that I gave you? Did you dig in? Did you dig in deep? Were you consistent at digging in every single day? I'll tell you another thing is, hopefully, you end up moving out of mom and dad's house. You know, hopefully you don't stay living with them. Um, you move out. You're living in your own home. You start your own family. You've got to dig a well for your kids to raise them up. You've got to dig a well for your family. And you can't say, hey, you know what, kids? you got questions about the Bible. Go ask Grandpa. Because I don't know. You need to know. You need to dig down deep. You need to have the answers for your kids because, again, mom and dad aren't always going to be there. Another thing that happens, and this is sad, but sometimes mom and dad, they're digging their well and they're raising their kids, and then they grow weary and they just stop digging. And it gets backfilled. And mom and dad are like, you know, we went to church when we were young. Yeah, we used to do that. I used to read the Word of God every day. I'm old now. And they just, they give up. It happens, it's sad, but it, it happens. I'm thankful sitting next to my mom and dad is my grandma and grandpa. They never gave up. They keep digging in. They keep digging in. We got to keep digging in, but it's sad. There's some people, like I said, they, you know, you can't rely on mom and dad's well. They might have given up. It's not up to mom and dad. It's up to you. It's up to you. The, the second thing is this. Our enemy hates our well. He hates it. This, this ability to draw from God's word, this water just to draw it up and it be a source of life for us, he hates it. And we see in verse 18 that Isaac was, <laughs> I'm sorry, not verse 18. No, the, the verses we just did, uh, verses 16 and 17, um, that he was backfilling it. 
The enemy was backfilling it, right? Enemy loves backfilling our wells. I mean, I don't know about you, but, but sometimes when you start digging your well, have you ever felt like you, you, dig, you dig something out? Like you, you, you dig one scoop and the enemy like piles two scoops back into it? You ever feel like that? Where you're digging in and it's like, I should have a hole there, but there's a mound? What's going on? You know, the enemy hates your well. He doesn't want you digging your well. He's just going to keep pouring stuff. And just look at the, the Nile. I mean, the Nile is just this flow of water, right? And they were all worshiping false gods. They had all this stuff. I mean, that's how the enemy is. It's just a constant flow. God didn't design it like that for us. God designed it to where we need to dig in. He brought the people away from that steady flow and brought them to this place where they had to dig in. It had to be very deliberate for them. I use that word a lot, deliberate. When we go out to dig our well, it has to be deliberate. We can't expect that it's just going to happen. It needs to be a deliberate action. We need to actually put time in our schedule to make it happen. Otherwise, guess what? It won't happen. And the enemy's so good, he's just so good at it, He's going to flood you. He's going to bombard you with all sorts of trash. And the second you dig part of the hole, he's going to fill it in with something else. Which leads me to the third thing is this. You and I, we need to be more determined than the enemy. We need to be far more determined than he is. Take a look at verse 18. Because Isaac was determined. It tells us that he dug again the wells of water which he had dug in the days of Abraham and his father. For the Philistines had stopped them up after the death of Abraham. He called them by the names which his father had called them. And also in verse 19, Isaac's servants dug in the valley and found a well running with water there. Listen to this. You have to have a great desire for water if you want to have a great determination to dig. Let me say that again in a different way. If you really want the water of God's word, if you really want it, you're going to be determined to dig into God's word for it. And here's the fact. So many people, they want God's intervention in their life. They're, oh, you know, I'm having, I'm having financial trouble. God, would you just show me? Would you tell me? Would you do something? Would you interject, Lord? Would you have your way and do, just fix this for me? And Lord, I'm having trouble with my wife. I'm having trouble with my marriage, Lord. Would you just come in and help me fix this? And oh, I'm raising up these kids and they're just a problem, Lord. Would you help me raise them? Lord, would you do something in this? And then they just go along their life. And they don't dig into God's word. And I can tell you this because I've seen it. People come to me, hey, Pastor Tim, I would love some of your time. I'm having trouble with my marriage. Can we come in and just talk with you? Sure, come on in. Okay, what's going on with your marriage? Oh, we've got this going on. We've got this going on. We've got this going on. Okay, what does God's word say about that? I don't know. That's why we're here for you to tell us, Pastor. Tell us, what does God's word say about it? Well, you're not digging in and finding out. See, here's the deal is, it's not my job necessarily to tell you what God's Word says about it. It's your job to dig in and find out what God's Word says about it. It's my job to help you understand what He means when He says what He says. You know, I don't understand, Pastor. God says to do this. What does He mean? And that's where I come and go, look, this is what God's saying there. Oh, I get it. Okay, now, see, that's where I come in. That's, you know, if you look at Nehemiah, when they're building the wall, what happened at the end of that? The wall was built. Everybody stood up, and they read it, and everybody knows the Word of God. They know what it says. But then the elders help give the understanding. But everybody already knew what it said. You see, it's your job to know what God's Word says. You can come to me, of course. I'm here. That's my job. I'm here to help you. To help you and to help you understand what God's Word says. But it's your job to know it. See, I can't be with you Monday and Tuesday and Wednesday and Thursday and Friday. I get to be with you for, for a short period of time on Sunday morning. The rest of the week, is, uh, it's up to you guys to dig in. Dig your well. Find out what God has to say about your situation. And I'm telling you, He's got a lot to say. There is not a single aspect of your life that is untouched by his word. Every situation you're in, everything you've got going on, God has something to say about it in his word. Everything. We need to be way more determined than our enemy. 
Because he's got a lot he wants to do. He's got a lot of things he wants to throw into your well. It's not that God doesn't want to interact with us. Oftentimes it's just we don't really desire it. That's the truth. If we desired it, if we had a great desire for it, we would have a great determination to dig in. Now here's, here's where we get into the wells. Remember I said there's four wells. And I wanted to to kind of define these wells because the thing is each of these wells what you'll find each of these wells is a type of situation in our lives each of these wells is a well that needs to be opened up by every believer and there's a progression every well is a closer step towards God and so the first well we find it in verse 20 first well is the well of contention so notice in verse 20, because remember, they dug and they found water, right? Verse 20 says that the herdsmen of Gerar quarreled with Isaac's herdsmen, saying, the water's ours. So he called on the name, or he called the name of the well Esek because they quarreled with him. So God had made promises to Abraham, and earlier in the chapter, God reaffirmed those promises to Isaac. This land is yours. And Isaac believes the promises, and so he goes out and he starts digging himself a well in the land that God promised. This is mine. And yet as he digs, the enemy is quarreling with him. No, I want that land. I'm going to have that well. No, 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 no. It's mine. God gave it to me. No, it's ours. And they're bickering for this well. Now, years ago, before I gave my life over to the Lord guess what? The enemy was bickering over me. The enemy wanted me. My parents could tell you because it was hell having me as a son. Why was it hell having me as a son? Because the enemy was after me. The enemy knew just about me, just like he knows about every single one of you. The enemy knew that God wanted to use me for something. And God wants to use every single one of us. He has a plan for our lives. God has his plan and the enemy has his own. And what happened was my parents were training me up. They were raising me up. They knew that I was God's. They knew that God wanted to do something in me. They knew that I was going to dig my own well. They knew this. And the enemy says, no, I want him. No, I'm going to have him. And my parents were like, no, he's God's. No, I'm going to have him. No, he's God's. No, I'm gonna. And there was this quarrel, this bickering that was going on for me. And the same thing happens for every single one of you. You go to dig in. You go to have this relationship with God. And as you start to dig into that relationship and you want to draw from that, the enemy's going to come in and, no, I want it. No, I'm going to take that. You remember, if you've been a believer for any length of time, you remember those early struggles when you first started walking with God, those, those times where every day seemed like a battle. Maybe you're like, what do you mean those times? I'm in them. It's going on now, Pastor. I know it's not easy. Being a Christian, first of all, I'll tell you this. If anybody ever tells you being a Christian is easy, they're lying or they're a fool. Being a Christian is not easy. If it was, everybody would do it. Walking a Christian life is difficult. But I'll tell you this. It is far more difficult to not be a Christian. But you remember those early days where every day seemed like a struggle. Living for God seemed difficult, if not impossible, or am I just, if it's just me? Anybody else ever feel like that? Where walking with God just seems difficult or impossible. Like, I can't do the things God has called me to do. That's, that's okay. In fact, the things God calls us to do, we talked about this last week, they're impossible anyways. The only way it becomes possible is with Him. But a lot of people give up at this well. They just give up. They start to dig. The enemy comes along. I want it. It's mine. And, oh, okay, all right, enough's enough. That was hard work anyways. Digging into God's Word seems boring. It does. I mean, God's Word seems boring if you, if you don't dig in. But this, the more you dig in, the more exciting you find, you find it really truly is. It's so exciting. But some people give up at this well. And God doesn't want, he doesn't want us to stay at this well anyways. He wants us to move on. Isaac moves on to the second well. The second well, well number two, is the well of separation. And in verse 21, Isaac and his team, they, they dug another well, and they quarreled over that one also. So he called his name Sitna. So Esek to Sitna, 
they're moving on. There's separation. When I got done with that first well and I was digging and, and it became real clear that I was God's and I started moving on, there was a separation it's not that the battle was over. It's not that the quarreling was over. It's not that the enemy was like, okay, I give up. He's yours, God. No, the enemy was still after me. But now I started to get some separation. This well of separation is a well that is so necessary for each of us. We start to separate ourselves from the world. We start to have some distance between the way the world thinks and the way that we think. We start to separate ourselves out from the things that the world wants. And we start to find ourselves wanting more of what God wants. See, we need to have the separation. What happens all too often is people, they get to that first well and they keep digging at that first well. And there's this quarreling going on at this first well. And they're just digging in and digging in and digging in. And they just never, they never get any separation from themselves and the world. They're like, well, I want to be a Christian, but I also like doing the things I used to do. You know, I want to be a Christian, but, you know, those are my friends. You know, when I first became a Christian, I had to separate myself from the people I was hanging out. I had to separate myself. I couldn't be around them anymore. Couldn't. They were, a, they were what my mom told me. They were a bad influence on me. Stop hanging around those people, Tim. They're idiots, and you're becoming one just like them. Stop it. Wisen up. She was a lot more gracious. She didn't say it that bad. Well, sometimes you did, <laughs> but it needed to be said. But the thing is, we need, a, we need a little bit of separation, don't we? We need to be separated. That's the whole idea of holiness. Holiness means separated. That's what it means, separated for God and for his purposes. Whatever it is he wants to accomplish in your life as a believer, that's what you're about now. There's a separation between you and the world. You stop thinking like the world, you stop acting like the world, you stop enjoying the things that the world wants to enjoy. But yeah, but that stuff's fun. It's not fun, that, it's not fun the next morning, don't you remember that? Right? I mean, the next morning, yeah, it was fun the night before, but the next morning, oh, it's not fun anymore. I mean, that's the thing is, we sometimes go, well, no, I, I, liked, I liked that. We're like the, the Israelites coming out of Egypt. If you've read that story, you know what I'm talking about. They're like, oh, remember the garlic? Remember the onions in Egypt? Egypt was so awesome. Yeah, you were slaves. You were slaves in Egypt. Yeah, but, you know, at least we had the, the garlic and the onions. Come on, really? You'd rather go back to being a slave to have that? I mean, come on. And it's the same thing with us. There's a lot of times where, where we, you know, we see people give their life to the Lord and they're like, okay, now I'm God's and I'm separated. I'm, I'm holy for him. But wait a minute. But remember when we used to be able to do that? Wouldn't it be cool to still do that? And instead of having a separation, we find ourselves trying to be two things at the same time. And the, the Bible's real clear. Darkness and light cannot, they can't coexist. There has to be a separation. People... People get to this point where there should be the separation and they don't want the separation. And so they give up. But we need it. We need this well of separation. In fact, Romans 8, it tells us this about us, the carnal mind. In other words, the way, the way we naturally think. We're at enmity against God. In other words, we are just opposed to God. And his way of thinking, in fact, he tells us that his way of thinking is so much greater. Isaiah 55, 8, my ways of thinking are so much higher than yours. I'm so much beyond human way of thinking. In fact, your way of thinking, it's against me. You are at enmity with me. For it is not subject to the law of God, nor indeed can be. So then those who are in the flesh cannot please God. You ever found yourself operating in the flesh going, well, I want to be a Christian, but I'm still operating in the flesh? I don't know about you, but I found myself in that place where I, I want to be a Christian, but I'm still doing all this other stuff, and I don't know why I can't please God. I don't know what's going on. Well, I got to separate myself. And there's something that happens when you and I will dig that well of separation. Something happens. Instead of our minds being at enmity with God, we find that we're at enmity with the world. This is why I'm asking you to be at Menifee School District on Tuesday afternoon at 4.30. Because as a believer in Jesus Christ, 
these things that they're forcing on our children, your mind should be at enmity with that garbage. When we separate ourselves out from the world and we hear that somebody wants to teach our children, I'm not even going to say it. You guys have heard me say it. I'm embarrassed. Like I said, my mom would have smacked me in the mouth. I'm not joking. She would have smacked me in the mouth for saying some of this garbage that they're going to teach our children. We should be at enmity with that. We should. We should be separated out. And there should be something different about the way we think and how the world thinks. We should be at enmity with the world, not with God. It's a hard well to dig. It is. It's not a popular well to dig. A lot of Christians don't want to dig this well. When they get to this, they start to dig this well, they start to get separated, and they're like, oh, I don't know. I don't like it. People think I'm weird now. I don't like it. Oh, well, you know, I can't dress the way I used to dress. Well, yeah, I mean, you should dress in a way that's appropriate. You shouldn't be stumbling a brother. You know, there's, there's, there's different things that we do as believers because we're separated out and we're different. So it's not popular, and people give up. They don't want the well of separation. Listen, it's a well that needs to be opened in our lives. Third well is this. Verse 22, we find it. It's this well of room. It says in verse 22 that Isaac moved from there and dug another well. And they did not quarrel over it. For he said its name Rehoboth, which uh, he says, because for now... The Lord has made room for us, and we shall be fruitful in the land. In other words, the Lord has enlarged them. The Lord has made room for them, for their, for their gifting. It's this well of maturity that you get to as you've gone through wells of struggles. Um, you've been through many struggles, and you've made it to this point where God's enlarged you, and your gifting, and your passions, and your, your abilities, God's now created this room for you to operate. This room for you to do the things God's called you to do. It's this point where you wake up in the morning ready for another day of struggle, only this day is different. You wake up and you find that you've grown to this place where you're no longer walking around defeated. You wake up and you recognize you're walking around in victory. And I got to tell you, I mean, I'm, I'm examining my life as I've hit my 500th sermon. I believe this third well is the well that I'm at. And I can't wait till I get to the fourth well. Can't wait. We'll talk about that in just a minute. But I think the third well is where I'm at in my walk. And obviously, I'm still somewhat young, even though my kids would tell me I'm not. Um, I'm still somewhat young. I got a lot of life left, should the Lord tarry. Um, I think I'm at this third well. I mean, I've, I've gone through struggles in life. I've, I've overcome obstacles with the strength of God. And I'm at this point where I do believe God has made room for me. He's made room for my gifting. I mean, I've been able to do some amazing things lately. I mean, God has made room for me to teach at the Bible college now. And God has made room for me to work with California senators, and you know, in October, we're going to have one of the senators here and be able to speak to you guys, and, and I've been able to sit with our assemblywoman, Melissa Melendez, and, and God's opened these relationships for me to have to where our, our congregation can now have an effect in the community that we live in. We could be the salt and the light that God's called us to be, and God has opened that room for me to have those kind of relationships. Things like that, I just feel God has made room for me and my walk. And it's not that the struggles are over. It's that I wake up in the morning and I recognize, you know what? I am going to be attacked today, but I'm not defeated. I am going to be attacked today, but greater is he who is in me than he who is in this world. If he's for me, who could be against me? Nobody. God is for you. If God is for you, who could be against you? Nobody, nothing, nothing can trump God. Nothing. His strength in your life is huge. I love waking up knowing this. Because there's things going on. It's like, well, I should feel defeated. Well, I don't have to feel defeated. I don't have to. You know why? Because I belong to God. And I am weak. That's okay. See, that's a beautiful thing. When you come to, come to that point where you go, you know what? I'm weak. 
That's okay. You know why? I mean, even Paul, Paul boasts in his weaknesses. He says, I'm boasting about how weak I am. You know why? Because God said that his strength is made perfect in our weaknesses. See, some, sometimes in those early wells, I wanted to muscle through it. I wanted to go, I can do it. I'm strong enough. Oh, and I would punch through and muscle through, and it was miserable. And I wake up going, I've got to do it. I've got to do it. I've got to put, you know, and, and I would put this pressure on myself that didn't belong there because God says, come to me. Place your cares on me. I'm stronger than you. My burden is easy. Would you just come and cast your cares upon me? I'll help you out. And see, I, I was kind of like trying to muscle through in those first couple of wells. I found myself in this third well where I just wake up and go, you know what? I admit it, Lord, I'm weak. You got me. But you're strong. Your strength is made perfect in my weaknesses. And so I can just boast about my weaknesses and I don't have to act like I'm Mr. Tough Guy. God, you're God. I'm not. And I'm just going to move forward and do whatever you call me to do today because whatever you put before me, I can accomplish because you're in me. And that's it. I love being at this well. I love, I love waking up going, you know what? Whatever's God's God, he's going to accomplish. I don't even have to worry about it. As much as we want to, we can't get to this well without going through Isaac and Sitna. You can't just go straight to Rehoboth. You can't just go straight to this well of room because there's a growth process. There's a, a growth in wisdom and a growth in, in trusting in God's strength. There's, there's something that you get from digging those first two wells that you won't have getting into this third well. You won't have it and you need it. You need to struggle some. My, my mom and dad, they struggle. Eight kids. Oh my gosh. Some of you are like, yeah, she's crazy. Eight kids. You look at her, you wouldn't even tell she had eight kids. But she did. Crazy. Eight kids. But you struggle through. They've had a struggle. It's not been easy. They're on the fourth well, though. I can't wait till I'm on the fourth well. <laughs> It's a beautiful thing to, to see yourself progress in your walk with God. Many people give up. First well is too hard, and they just give up right away. Or maybe they, they get through that first well, and they get to that second one, they're like, I just don't like being separated. I don't like being different. I don't like, I don't like being weird. I've said this before. Christians are weird. We're weird. We are. We should be. I mean, we're weird. Weird means different than everything else. If something's weird, it's out of place. It's different, right? We're weird. If we're not weird, we're not being the Christians God calls us to be. We're supposed to be weird. Everybody's supposed to look at us and go, there's something different. There's something weird about that family. They're always laughing and smiling like the Brady Bunch. It's weird. You know, there's, there's a lot of people that never get to this well. And they give up and they burn out on the struggles of opening up these wells. Fourth well is this. It's the well of blessings. And, and I say the well of blessings. It's not the actual name of the well here. The well here is the well of oaths. Um, but what we're going to find is there's an oath that is made and there's a blessing. There's actually multiple blessings that come from, from God in making the, the oath that Isaac makes. So let's take a look at the scripture. I'm going to read through this and then we'll talk about it. Starting there in verse 23. We see that Isaac went up there from, uh, to uh, Beersheba. And the Lord appeared to him the same night and said, I am the God of your father Abraham. Do not fear, for I am with you. I will bless you and multiply your descendants for my servant Abraham's sake. So, verse 25, he built an altar there and called, the name, called on the name of the Lord, and he pitched his tent there, and there Isaac's servants dug a well. Then Abimelech came to him from Gerar and Ahuzeth, uh, one of his friends, and uh, Pekel, the commander of his army. And Isaac, in verse 27, said to them, Why have you come to me, since you hate me and have sent me away from you? But they said, We have certainly seen that the Lord is with you. So we said, Let there now be an oath between us. <clears throat> let there be an oath between us, between you and us, and let us make a covenant with you, that you will do us no harm, since we have not touched you, and since there has been nothing done to you but good, and have sent you away in peace. You are now 
the blessed of the Lord. So in verse 30, he made them a feast and they ate and drank. Then he arose early in the morning and swore an oath with one another. And Isaac sent them away and they departed from him in peace. It came to pass the same day that Isaac's servants came and told him about the well which they had dug and said to him, we have found water. And so he called it Sheba. Therefore, the name of the city is Beersheba to this day. Now, again, Sheba means oath. But the city is named Beersheba to this day. When Esau was 40 years old, he took his wives Judith and his daughter Beri, uh, the Hittite, and Basemath, the daughter of Elon, the Hittite. And verse 35, they were a grief of mind to Isaac and Rebekah. So the name of this well is Oath. And we just read that Isaac did make an oath. And what we hear is God blessed Isaac in this. And so let me just share these blessings with you. One, he said that I'm your God and I'm going to be with you continually. I'm going to always be with you. You're never going to have to worry about anything. I'm always there. And not only that, he says, I'm going to multiply you. I'm going to increase your descendants. I'm going to increase your blessings. There's going to be years of increase. Isaac, you're going to walk in plenty. You're not going to walk in lack. And you're no longer going to live a hit and miss life. You see, sometimes we start drilling down, we start digging down, and we're not, we're not getting there. You know what I mean? Sometimes you just, you're, it's hit and miss. And there's times where, and I'll admit it, there's times where I've dug into God's Word, and I'm just like, I'm not, I'm not digging into it spiritually. I'm just digging it into the flesh where it's like a check mark, right? I'm just like, check, did my reading. I don't know about you guys, but I'll admit it. I've done that where I'm just like, oh, I have to read the Word of God. Open up, read. Okay, I did it. And I'm not getting what I, I should be getting out of it. I mean, God's Word doesn't return void. I'm not saying that. But what I'm saying is me and my flesh, I've gone about it, and I'm not getting what I should be getting from it because I didn't go about it properly. You get to this well, and you dig down. You're going to get this water that's just overflowing. You're, you're, you get to this point where you open it up, and you know the second you open it up. It's just this maturity that comes that the second you open God's Word, is, it's going to speak to you. It's going to give you everything you need. Your mindset is right immediately going into it. You get to this point where it's just this blessing. I know this. My mom wakes up every morning at like 2 o'clock in the morning expecting to hear from God. Opening God's Word, starting to pray at 2 in the morning. I told you, she's crazy. <laughs> but she does it. She opens up. She's just expecting it. It's just, she's come to this point in life where it's just going to happen. She knows it. There's no, there's no question, is God going to speak to me right now? There's no question, am I going about this right? She just opens it up and God starts speaking. You get to this point where your well becomes a city. If you go to Beersheba, I mean, you go to Israel today, you can go to Beersheba. It's still there. So if you're driving from Jerusalem back to the airport, you go right, right past it. I keep throwing these plugs in because I want you guys to go to Israel with me. I want you to go out and experience this. But I'm telling you, it's, it's an amazing thing that Isaac's well is still there today. And it's when you dig down and you get to this point where you've dug deep and you get this well that's got so much, it's not just a blessing to you. People are drawn to your well at that point. People come, they want to get something from it. My parents have done that. They've dug in deep. They've got this well that's just overflowing. And they've got kids, of course. They've got a lot of kids, a lot of grandkids. How many grandkids now? 14? 14 grandkids. It's awesome. I don't even have one yet. Come on, Jacob. <laughs> I want grandkids. I, sorry, son. I, keep throwing that in there. I can't wait to be a grandfather. But, but I think about this, like kids, grandkids coming to them, in-laws coming to them. But it's not just us. Other people come to them. Other people want to know what they have to say. They want to draw from that well. What do you got? And they, they come and I'm telling you, you get to this point in your life where you've dug in so deep and your well is so rich. And you just, it's just, you got so much. And people are going to be drawn to that from all over the place. Isaac got to that point. Isaac had faith and he had this determination to keep moving on. And as we close this morning, I want to encourage you, keep digging. Keep digging. Get to that last well. 
Keep digging in every single day. Don't let a day go by where you're not digging. And don't ever let the enemy throw more in than you're digging out. He's going to keep doing it. He's determined. You've got to be more determined than the enemy. You've got to keep digging and digging. And when he's digging two scoops, you've got to dig four. I mean, you've got to just keep digging in and digging in. Don't let me be your only source. Don't let Sunday morning be your time in the Bible. Dig in every day. Dig in twice a day. Dig in three times a day. Get up at two in the morning. Do whatever you have to do to dig, 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 dig your well. You've got to do it. And I'm telling you, we live in a day and age where you can pay somebody to do just about anything for you. People pay people to mow their lawns. People pay people to drive them. I mean, you just get on a phone and Uber shows up at your doorstep, you know. People pay people to go grocery shopping for them. You know, people, you can pay people to do anything for you. Pay them to groom your dogs. You can pay them to groom you. You can pay, I'm telling you, you can pay people to do just about anything for you nowadays. You're a college student, you can pay people to do your homework. I'm not saying you should. You cannot pay anyone to dig this spiritual well for you. You can't. You, you have to dig this well all on your own. Your wife can't dig it for you. Your husband can't dig it for you. Your parents can't dig it for you. Your kids can't dig it for you. You got to get dirty. You got to dig down deep. And you're going to have an enemy trying to backfill it the whole way. You've got to dig deep into God's word. I'm telling you, if you do that, you're going to be blessed. You're going to be blessed. Let's pray right now. Father in heaven, thank you. Well, hey, I hope that message you just heard was a blessing to you. It was a challenge to you. It was encouragement to you. Most of all, I hope that if you are a person who has not given your life to Jesus, that this message just encourages you to do just that. It's very simple to do. All you have to do is believe in your heart, confess with your mouth that Jesus Christ is Lord. And you can say this prayer with me right now. Father in heaven, I confess to you today that I am a sinner uh, Lord, that I have messed up in life. I haven't lived up to your very high standard, nor can I. And so I'm grateful for what I understand today. I understand that you sent your son Jesus to walk here on this earth, to live a life of perfection, to die a death on a cross, to go into the grave, but not just to stay there. He came out, he rose again, and I believe that today. I believe he sent his Holy Spirit. Lord, that as I believe in you today, your Holy Spirit will come upon me that you will take up residence within me, that you will give me the strength, you will give me the wisdom, you will give me the courage, you will give me the boldness, the faith, everything I need to live for you. And so I promise this day forward that my life will be a life spent trying to please you. I pray, Lord, that as I mess up, and I know I will, I pray that your grace and your mercy would be upon me and that you would give me the encouragement to move forward. And I pray this in Jesus' name, amen. Hey, listen, if you just said that prayer, first of all, I want to welcome you to the family of God. I want you to know that angels in heaven are rejoicing, and we here at 412 Marietta want to rejoice with you. And the next thing you got to know is there's a step that goes beyond giving your life over to Jesus. This is the step called discipleship. And what this is, is the process that you begin to grow in this newfound faith of yours. And we don't want to leave you alone to do that by yourself. God has given his Holy Spirit to you to help you in that, and he brings other people around you. And so we here at 412 Marietta want to help you in that process. So come on out to the church. We'd love to give you the encouragement, give you the tools that you need in this newfound faith. And uh, we'd love to help you grow in your walk. And so come on out on Sundays, 9 o'clock, 11 o'clock. And if you do, come on out and say hello to me. I'd love to get to meet you and encourage you in your faith. God bless you. I love you.